Welcome to Winning Conversations. We have a treat for you today. Hannah and I get to sit down with a sweet couple here at Heritage. Natalie and Phelan Barthen have been attending Heritage for five years and serve in various areas, including our preteen department, the worship team, and security. They also have a thriving ministry called Strong Tower, an evangelistic music ministry, where they are on the road bringing the anointing everywhere they go. Let's jump into this conversation and hear their story. Start with your story. How did you get together? How did y'all get involved with ministry? Start at the beginning. Okay. Um, well, I grew up in ministry. My dad is a pastor, so I grew up as a pastor's kid. PKs represent. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was on the worship team. I started singing probably when I was about three years old and just grew up my entire life singing and being on the worship team. Um, and then as far as us getting together, well, he, you had your own part of ministry yes. before we got married. Yes. You have to share that. I can't. What was, oh, your, what was your ministry? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> Tag, you're it. <laughs> um, well, around 17 years old, um, my desire was to go into special forces and, and to do different things in the military. And, um, and around 17, at, at the church I was going to at the time, they invited a prophetess, Aquila Nash, uh, to come in and to, to just preach. And she stood me, I, ha- I had no clue who she was, but she stood me up in the middle of the service and said, I, I see you doing this. It looked like playing drums. And she said, I see you graduating with honors. And immediately my heart switched from military to ministry. And that's when I went out and bought a drum set because that's what I thought that it was at the time. And uh, about a month later, no lessons, I was on a worship team playing drums. And then the Lord just started using me in music and then getting into the dulcimer field. So around 17 years old, songs started coming to me, uh, melodies, and, and I would go out and minister the gospel. And so that's what I did. We'd go to coffee shops. Coffee shops were big in that day. And so you would just go to different coffee shops, different venues, and uh, play and sing and have altar calls. And that's what I did for a while until we met. And then we just merged it together and kept on going. No lessons? No Still lessons. No lessons. Nice. no lessons. Very nice. Um, and how, how did y'all start your ministry, um, Strong Tower? First, let me just explain what Strong Tower is. So Strong Tower is a ministry geared towards youth and young adults. And it's to disciple them in the Word of God, but also to train them up in life skills, cooking, cleaning, um, changing the oil, changing a tire, just basic things that kids and young adults don't know now because they're not taught that anymore. Um, so that's what Strong Tower is as a whole. And about six years ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, we sat down with a man at a camp at TBI. Hmm. And he started just unloading. He was he was on staff there at TBI, and he just said, hey, can I have a seat and chat with y'all? And so he did, and he just starts unloading all of this information about this ministry that he started years prior. And we're sitting there listening to it and thinking in the back of our heads, this is exactly what we want to do with Strong Tower, which at the time, I don't even think we had a name. It was just the ministry we wanted to do. And he starts outlining, well, let me just tell you exactly how I did it. And we never told him our vision, nothing. He knew nothing about what was going on. As a matter of fact, the night before, Phelan was sitting with one of our youth guys, Nicholas, and just sharing with him his heart about the ministry that we wanted to start but didn't know how to start it. And just question after question after question, he would just give out to Nicholas and in the middle of this conversation with this man at camp, Nicholas walks up and sits down and he starts listening. And after, I don't know, probably about 45 minutes or an hour, that pastor got up and, well, it's been nice chatting with y'all. And he walks away and he leaves. And Nicholas just blank faced looks at Phelan and says, he literally just answered every question that you had about how to start. And so we knew it was a God thing. So all we did was we came home and we said, let's just get this going. Let's start and see where God takes it. So we started it and um, we held it at the church that we were on staff at at the time. And it was on Sunday nights. And we grew up to probably about 30 youth and young adults coming on a regular basis um, just to hear the word of God. And then we would try to have adults would come in. 
Oh yeah. We would have, we would have grandparents come to drop their kids off and they would stay just to kind of see what was going on. And then they would just start coming back every week to listen because they enjoyed what they were learning, what they were hearing. Um, it was really, it was quite funny. Uh, and then we would have like Saturday things, what we called life pillars. And we would have the kids show up on a Saturday morning. We would have an opening Devo worship. And then we had different pockets for them to go to. So they cooked their own lunch and then they went to a finance class. And then the guys went over to a guy's class and the girls went to girls class to learn how to be a young man and a young woman of God. And and they would alternate pillars during the day. Yeah. That way everybody gets the same the stuff teaching. that like should be taught in schools that is not taught. <laughs> exactly. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. I love yeah. that. Um, do y'all incorporate your musical backgrounds in this? Like, do y'all do something with music in the ministry? We'll do yeah. worship. And, and one of the things that we're desiring, um, it, it's harder without a venue right now, mm-hmm. um, but we're desiring to start teaching this next generation kind of how to worship, uh, to allow silence in the Word. You know, sometimes you can just stop the music and wait on the Lord. You don't have to rush anything. Yeah. And so that's kind of what we're desiring to teach is, is for people to start. How do you get intimate? How do you hear his voice? Well, you got, there's, there's ways to do that. And um, some of them see a formula and try to go by a formula, and it's not really working too well for them. And so they need to learn kind of how to, to be still before the Lord. And it doesn't always have to be a form. You can it, change it up. Exactly. That is correct, yes. When needed yeah. also. Yes. But you do more than that too, I hear. You are... Skilled in other areas, like what would that? <laughs> like, you are skilled. Like I, you teach karate, right? Uh, or I've heard these things. I don't yeah. know though. I, I'm interested in hearing about it. A few weeks ago, I told Tanya this. A few weeks ago, I was walking by you and you were talking to somebody. I don't remember who. And all I hear was, "If you had a pair of nunchucks," and then that's all I heard. And I was like, "What was that a conversation yeah. about?" So please explain what what is it that you do? Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> my life is very interesting in the fact that I cannot give credit to anything that I have ever learned or done. God has to get all the credit for it, and it's it's really hilarious. I mean, just with the music, no lessons out of the blue. God just drops something and I'm able to play. It's, it's strange. And it's the same thing with martial arts. I tell people all the time, I've been in it for 40 years now, and I have paid, my mother paid for maybe a year's worth of lessons for me. Everything else, when I would go to a studio and they would say, I like him, even though he's an orange belt, we're putting him in advanced classes. So I would train with the black belts, I would train with the brown belts. And for 40 years, it has been that way. I have not paid for maybe a year and a half of martial arts out of that. And so, yes, I started, I started with uh, when I was around seven years old and started American karate, then went into Aiki Jiu-Jitsu and uh, Taekwondo. And so I've got some high rankings in that, if, if you want to say high rankings, because you're always learning. You're never really, you never really arrive at anything with that. And, and then the Lord started opening doors for me to teach security teams. So I've taught several church security teams and trained them, uh, women's self-defense, private self. I, I, my favorite is, is, is teaching self-defense. Yeah. I love teaching self-defense because martial arts is a long-term art. It's not a sport. Um, but you can go in and teach self-defense, teach people awareness, teach people how to um, uh, live and survive. You know, you might not win the fight, but you will live. Because if you're not trained, then you're just going to lose it. Huh. But at least if you're trained, you can at least survive it. You know? We need to get wow, Hannah, yeah. We need to get on, in on some of those lessons. <laughs> I thought you were about to say Hannah <laughs> needs to be in on some of those no, lessons. No, I was like, oh wow, me and Hannah both. We need to take <laughs> we some need of those some lessons. Of those. Yes, yeah. we need to survive, Andy. We do need to. We've survive. got the Holy Spirit on our side, <laughs> but we need we need some wisdom and how to apply some uh, tactical things. I, right. I like that. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. So your journey into the ministry, um, people often see the fruit and not the roots. Has it always been smooth and easy transitioning <laughs> into is that your even ministry? A thing? Yeah, is, is you that know. Even a thing? I don't think that's a thing. Oh my gosh, I the don't stories. Think or thing. how do you? Okay, a better question would be: When things get rocky in your ministry or in your life in general, what do you do to smooth things out to 
get through the storm to get past the rocky seasons. That's good. We wait. <laughs> we don't make yeah. a move until we know that we know that we know. And, and, and I'm the guy personally that the Lord has to kick in the rear to get me to move a step. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just who I am. Some people will step out on faith, step out on faith. I believe in stepping out on faith, but I also believe that you don't step out on faith until you hear what you need to do first. Until you get your word from God. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And so um, if not, sometimes you can go before the Lord, yeah. and the Lord said, you know, I didn't tell you to go. It's failing because I didn't tell you to go. But once you know that you know, then, you know, so I say wait. That's that's, that's my interesting. biggest deal. That's yeah. interesting. I feel like we hear a lot of different things, and it's really dependent on the person and on the season and on the situation because, you know, a lot of times you could, you hear from God and you just, you do it, you just do it, which we've heard in this podcast, and that is a way to do it, and that's awesome, but also waiting is a good, it, it just depends on the person, and it depends on the situation. You have to know that you heard from God, and yes. if you are swayed any way, then you need, to, like you said, go before him, confirm it, mm-hmm. yes. and then do it. Yeah, yeah we, were, um, we were worship pastors and youth pastors at a church before we came to, to, to Heritage <laughs> And um, when we started Strong Tower this last year, uh, the last year there, <clears throat> it started growing, started flourishing. And then all of a sudden, the pastor, it's amazing that when you get, catch a vision from the Lord, sometimes other people don't catch that vision. Mm-hmm. And so immediately, we got opposition. Uh, and that's how the devil does it. You know, every time the word is given, there's going to be an opposition afterwards. And so we were fired from the church, and rumors started spreading. And it was just a crazy, crazy thing. And uh, But the year prior to that, we started feeling like we weren't supposed to be there. Yeah. And the Lord started preparing things. He woke me up in the middle of the night and said, go get some recording equipment and start recording again. I mean, it was... It was just clear as day, and so I told my wife. So we started doing that. Mm -hmm. And so we started moving forward. So for the first year of of the weird feelings of we don't really need to be here yet, but we don't feel released to leave, Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, bam, you know, uh, we're fired. So I freaked out, not going to lie. I mean, this is testimony time. Mm -hmm. So I freaked out because I grew up with a dad who says, you know, you don't work, you don't eat. And uh, you get up in the middle of the night, and he was a construction worker, and he'd wake me up, you know, at six, six years old and say, you're coming with me at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I worked my life. That's how I worked. And so to not have a job supplied for me, this was the first time ever that no job was supplied. And I was praying to the Lord, what do I do? What do I do? And I took a rushed job, and uh, it was like Joseph being in a dungeon. I mean, it was just horrible. And but God so, even moved through that because oh, we needed favor. we needed X amount of money to just survive, and yes. they were going to pay under that. And whenever He got in there, they said, "You know what? We want to pay you this much money to come in favor. and work." So favor. yeah, God worked favor. through it. But yeah, just favor even in, in the places that you don't want to be. God yeah. does it. He's amazing. And so um, at that at that time, I said, "Honey, I just can't keep doing this." And she said, "Well, let's just quit your job and let's step out." And let's wait and see what God has in store. And that's exactly what happened. So we stepped out. I quit the job, stepped out, and I started calling churches so that we could go and minister. Youth camps, churches, you name it. And I called around 60. And every one of them but one shut me down. We don't want you. Not our type of music. We already have a worship team. We have this. We have that. And You know, you get put down over and over and over again. It plays a toll on your spirit, you know, and on your mind. And so I was out on the fence, literally on a fence, sitting and praying to God. And for the first time ever, I said these words. I said, God, I quit. I said, I don't quit you, but I quit the ministry. And I have never quit anything in my life that those words don't come out of me. And right when I said that, I got up and started walking back to the house, and I got a phone call, and we had met some evangelists 
uh, named the Bullocks. They're out of Daystar. And we met them, and, and about a month or so prior, he said, I've got a guy that I want you to get in touch with. And he said, I'll, I'll just have him call you. He said, I think you guys are going to hit it off. And so I get up from the fence, I'm walking back, and I get a phone call. And it was the man that he wanted me to talk with. And his name was Bill Nash. And I don't mind saying these names mm-hmm. because these guys are amazing, you know, men of God. And uh, Bill Nash has Champions Kids Camp. Uh, he helps kids who've been through traumatic events. And he said, how you doing? And just joyful man. And I, I told him, just, I'm a very truthful guy. I told him how I was feeling. And he said, I hope you get 100 no's. He said, you keep doing it. This is for God, and this is for your family. This is what you're called to do. You keep doing it. And he, if it was not for that phone call at that timing, I uh, don't know if we'd be here today. Um, God knows exactly what you're going through. You, know, you can be all alone. It doesn't matter. Just like Nathaniel underneath the tree, Jesus said, I saw you underneath that tree. And God saw me at that fence, and he knew what we needed. And that got me back into the ministry, got us back going again, and I looked at my wife and I said, I'm not able to call churches anymore. And so we made the decision, we're not going to call churches. We're just going to let God do it. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yep. And once we stopped and waited, churches just started calling. Yep. And uh, we've been going for five years ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you get connected with Heritage? It was, uh, so 2017, April, Easter Sunday, actually, was where we were fired from the church, the day after Easter Sunday. And um, we were, uh, I mean, we were broken. There's no other way to put it. We were broken. We were at the point to where we were like, I don't even know if I want to look for a church right now. A couple months rolled by, and it was the Kenneth Copeland Convention, and We looked online to see who the speakers were, what the schedule was, all of that. And somehow or another, we came across, I don't even know how it was, but we found out that Jerry'sville had a church here in the area, and we had no idea. We were clueless on that. And so we're like, well, huh, that'd be kind of fun. And actually, there was something on there that said that they were looking, they didn't have youth pastors, or they were looking for youth pastors pastors or something. And of course, that's what we came from. And our heart is youth, so we're like, let's just go visit the church and just kind of see what happens. I don't know. Um, so at, I guess it was around July, August of 2017 is whenever we visited Heritage the first time. And there was just something there immediately that first week of just different events that took place, as even as simple as Pastor Justin calling us, and the way that he spoke to me on the phone when he called was just like he had known us forever. And I told Phelan about it, and he said, well, maybe we just need to go back. So we came back, and we were coming to this one, and then we were visiting another church um, in the Fort Worth area. And every time we would come to church on Sunday or Wednesday, he would preach a sermon that oh was gosh. exactly what Phelan had been studying the week prior. I mean, yeah. to a T, every time we came to service and we're like, all right, Lord, we get it. We get it. <laughs> and so for, I mean, year after year after year, every time we're coming in and it's something that has to do with either something we're teaching ourselves to the youth or I've whether we're I've got it all written looking. down in a book. It's just, yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> been amazing. Yeah. So that's how we kind of came to be here at Heritage. And when we got here, we both decided, because I love worship, and not being on a worship team just broke me. It's just, it's my passion. But there was just something, I just sat back and I said, I don't feel like that's what I'm supposed to do right now. I think now's the time to just sit here and be fed and be restored. Wait. Yes, season. That's so important. And just wait and see what God has and let him do the healing first from all of that that we've gone through and just see where things go from there. And so that's kind of what we did. And it's just been recently that we've been able to step into positions of helping out in different areas, the preteens and leading worship every once in a while on Wednesday and um, security, hospitality, just different things has just been so recent. And a lot of that also has to do with the fact that we travel so much that we can't really commit to be here, but we're in another season of here being home and not traveling as much so we have the ability to be able to start serving um in a different capacity so yeah i'm gonna 
piggyback off of that. Is that is it okay? Yeah. That we have yes. Time? Yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> so uh, there was a uh, in this season. I would get up in the morning and I would go to a school that had been abandoned, and I would rock around that school and pray and believe for a building for a strong tower and just pray throughout the day, Lord, what do you want? You know. And um, I was praying, and I picked up an acorn. It's a funny story. I picked up an acorn, and I said, God, this is my dreams and my expectations, and I know what you've called us to do, and this is it, but I don't want it. And so I buried it in the ground, and then I picked up one of those bigger acorns, and I said, this is your dreams and your expectations for us. This is what I want. So whatever it is, I'm open to it. So the next Sunday, we come here to Heritage, and Pastor Justin is speaking, and he goes over to his chair, and he grabs an acorn. And he said, these, oh, wow. I, yeah, and he said, these are wow. your dreams. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's and amazing. he said, your dreams have to die. Yeah. And so he, he, you know, set that down. And then he picked up the same big acorn that I had. I, I've got them in our living That's room. That's awesome. And, and, and uh, picked up the same big acorn. He said, these are God's dreams. And, you know, he can do exceedingly above all that you can <laughs> ask. Her and this is how it was, seriously, yeah. Sunday after Sunday yeah. after Sunday. That we Down to a, the T. We were at a town in Midland one time, and we taught the youth on a Wednesday night at my parents' church in Midland. And he taught a message on just being pliable and letting God kind of move you and mold you where he wants you. So while he was teaching, we had the youth play with Play-Doh. And we came back home, and that next Wednesday we came to church, and Pastor Justin is talking about you have to be pliable and let God move you around. And he even used Play-Doh as an example. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is just, and it was time after time. It wasn't just these two instances. It was regular basis. (laughs) Almost every Sunday, every Wednesday, things like this would happen. And we're like, all right, we're getting the message, Lord. (laughs) We're where we're supposed to be. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing and... So for anybody leave. out there who has been hurt by another church, because I've been through churches that has two church splits, believe it or not. And so um, I know what it's like growing up in church. I know what it's like, you know, politics. You see it all, right? You see it, everything. And, uh, you know, people hurt you, all that kind of stuff. So if you've ever gone through that or if you're going through that, the truth of the matter is, number one, you got to forgive people. Yeah, You've got to move on because... If you don't move on and forgive, you'll never be used of the Lord. Yeah, he's true. he's just going to keep you there until you until you let go. Yep. Yeah. And and then you need to wait. Once you move on, you have to wait and you have to allow God to minister. And we've been waiting for 5 years and God has used us and we have been supplied for. I mean, I I can't tell you in the last the first 2 years we stepped out People won't believe this. When we tell this story, they just don't believe it. You know, our rent yearly was more than we made that year. We I made a it. little. I 100% believe it. We yeah. lived, we <laughs> lived over a little t- of $10,000 a year. Yeah. For the first two for years. For the first two years. Yep. Two boys traveling, singing. We went to Korea. We went to Japan the very first year that... We were walking by faith. We all paid. Yeah, twenty six states. Weeks there, yeah. We we left to go someplace that we were going to sing. Didn't even get paid for it, and we get there, and the Lord just starts opening doors, mm-hmm. and so we just start driving and playing. Yeah. Just story after story, but yeah, those of you who are out there, you got you got to learn to forgive. You got to let go, and. Um, you got to wait on the Lord. Don't get in a rush to get back in the ministry. Just God's so timing good. is the best God's timing. timing is yeah, the best. it is. And I and I want to go back to what you were saying too. It just touched me because um, I think a lot of times when once we get back in that church, like you were saying, it's good to just sit and to soak. It's yeah. important that we listen to the season that God has us to be in. Because I remember when we first came. A lot of people were like, "Oh, they're going to get in there and they're going to serve. They're going to serve. They're going to serve." But for the first year, I mean. 
God told us to sit and to soak. And I truly believe it's like what our hearts needed because sometimes when you pour out and you pour out and you pour out because you're doing ministry all the time, you need to be poured yes. back into. And then when God says go, then it's divine. Yeah. Then his hands are on it. But if you try to go out before that timing and, and, and people don't have to understand that, you know, it's, it's your relationship with the Lord. And if he tells you to sit and to soak for a year, then that's what you do. That's right. the most important is that you obey him. So I love that you're obedient. And I love that you took that time to sit and to soak and to let God pour into you. Um, and it kind of goes into our next question, which is, since you've been a member of Heritage, how has it really impacted your ministry? Definitely growth. I mean, like he said, when we came from the other church, it was a, um, they had the mentality of they liked where they were. Yeah. They had the mentality of, I don't know that I really want to grow too much bigger because... I like where we are right now. This is comfortable. comfortable. And you see that yes. a lot of places yeah. too. Yes, you know? absolutely. Yes. And, you know, we would we would talk to them about growth. We would talk to them about different things to do to be able to grow a little bit more and get youth in and get this going and that going. And again, always hit with opposition. Well, how are you going to get the money for that? Well, where are we going to put them when they, we get them there? Well, where are they going to park? Because we have a small parking lot. It was all such small-minded and so it, it got to the point to where we... You're trapped. Yeah, you're trapped. And we <laughs> didn't even know how to dream big anymore because every time we would, we were hit with reasons why you can't. Mm -hmm. So coming to Heritage and just being fed, God's big enough. Yeah. God can make anything happen if it's his will. And... Just that mindset for me alone. I know the other day, uh, Phelan and I were sitting and talking about some things, and I said, you know, I was thinking the other day that the way things fell apart at our old church stunk. There's no other way to put it. It was not right. It was not good. But if that hadn't happened, we would not be where we are today. And the yeah. growth that we have had over these past five years in so many areas of our life yeah we would not have been able to experience because we would still be stuck at that church mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have the mindset that we do now that we're taught every Sunday and every Wednesday when we come to church. Well, it's like here. Joseph. You know, Joseph was over a house and he was over land and he was over people and he could have stayed there. But if it wasn't for him being accused of something that he didn't do yeah. and now he's thrown into a prison, he would have never been second in command over Egypt. Yeah. So there has to be a point of of growth in that yeah. area and now he surrounds himself with kings and with princes and it's the same thing here you know you get surrounded by people of faith yeah they have like bigger minded. dreams than you bigger expectations mm -hmm. and it makes your expectations and dreams bigger because you understand that god's not a god who limits himself it's shifting perspectives too. Yes. Yeah. Whenever you're in those hard moments, those hard times, you could doubt a lot of things. But if you shift your perspective, like you said, you realize that if you hadn't had gone through that, then you wouldn't be where you are or right. you wouldn't have experienced this growth. It's mm -hmm. in the moment, it can be hard to realize that. But if you shift your perspective and think there's so much that I could, you know, now the possibilities are endless. I can go anywhere. I can do anything. I can, but you have to have that trust and right. the ability to hear from God and to know that he's got you and know his timing is good Perfect. and it yes. will yeah. come whenever it's supposed to. Yeah. Right. But this is now yeah. your testimony that you yeah. can share with other people and inspire them and yeah, move yeah. them. Yeah. And that we serve a limitless God. Yes. We serve a limitless God. I know when, okay, Hannah grew up Baptist. Okay. Love my Baptist folks, love my Baptist people. <laughs> but that was, that was all I knew. And I remember going into my senior year, I told myself, I, I heard the Lord saying, I'm more than this. I've got more for you. Think of me outside of the box of what you typically know or what you're typically around. And that's that out of the box thinking. And that's the same thing that you guys were feeling within your church congregation. It brought me back to that time. And right around that same time, my senior year is when I met, like right after that, I met Terry. 
And I learned word of faith and I'm like, wow, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know? And so, um, I love that. And I pray for the church that you came from, that they get that same out of the box mindset so that they can continue to grow and to thrive into what God has for them because he's limits off, you know? So we're going to kind of switch. We're going to kind of switch around and go on to our next subject, which is you have two wonderful sons. (laughs) Tell us the joys and challenges of raising kids. Now, I don't know your sons like a ton, but they, I do see them talking to Terry occasionally and I always see them in my social media notifications like heart 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 I'm like oh I know that kid you know but anyways they're so sweet you're raising such great great children of faith Um, so tell us a little bit about you know mom and dad life with them oh wow it's it's always busy (laughs) <laughs> it's always busy because yeah, you homeschool, yeah, right? We we do. We've homeschooled pretty much from the beginning. Our oldest, Kedron, um, he went to public school kindergarten for the first half, and at December break, we said we're done, and we pulled him and started homeschooling. Wow, that's amazing! So we've homeschooled since that point. Um, it definitely has its challenges. Yeah, how do you balance it all? Between homeschool and ministry and business. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, they travel with us. Um, I mean, you know, it's just, honestly, it's a trial and error kind of thing a lot of times. And it's a lot of grace. I have to give myself a lot of grace (laughs) because I don't want to even say every day is not perfect. There's hardly ever any Perfect. There's never, a, I don't remember ever having a perfect day. There's always something. Well, our schedule is a schedule of no scheduling. Exactly. I mean, Which is really hard. Once you're, on the road, yeah, mm-hmm. once you're on the road and you're going, yeah. you have the expectation of, oh, the kids will do the you know, schoolwork in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, I want sure. McDonald's. Pull over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't work in the car. I get yeah. headaches. It makes me nauseous. It makes me this. I so can't. yeah, there's yeah, challenges in all of that. Yeah. I just want to yeah. say though, I didn't realize how young Kendron, he's our drummer, our yeah. drummer here at Heritage. I didn't realize how young he was. He is good. Thank, Thank you. you. For Thank his, you. I mean, for his age, I was impressed. Like, Wait, what like is his you? age? I mean, has he Tell had everybody. lessons Let's like see. you? He's or 15. He's 15. He He'll be 16 in February. Was, okay. I want to say he started playing when he was, what, six? No, 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 no. Maybe younger? No, yes. He was about four when he first sat behind yeah. the drum set. Wow. And the very first time he sat behind the drum set and he started beating on it. It. <laughs> it was not <laughs> beating. Yeah, it he, was, he, he had, had rhythm. rhythm. We're like, wait, what? <laughs> so I showed him some things, but he's, he's a very visual learner. So I will show him something and then he'll watch something on YouTube or, you know, her he'll brother's professional it. drummer. So he'll kind of send a couple of lessons every now and then, but he's just, he was playing for uh, the other church we were at for strong tower and people would look around because he was so small. Couldn't even see him over the drum <laughs> set. Oh, oh, the drum set. Oh. <laughs> even people on would think mornings. it was an adult yeah. playing. I mean, it was just, um, he's just oh. got that gifting. God gave him a gift. And that's great talent. that you all as parents leaned into that gifting. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so important that as parents, we're looking at our child's gifts at a young age. And that's yeah. great that you immediately saw it. You leaned into it. And now look, he's playing for the church. For the church. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it, really cool. It's easy as an adult to get caught up in well, I'm an adult. I already know this. I don't need no kid telling me, you know, but I'll be in the recording studio and I'm laying down a guitar track or whatever. And he'll knock on the door at like you know, 10 years old. Daddy, I'm really hearing this <laughs> right there. And I'd say, yeah, whatever, you know, just I'm, I'm in yeah. the middle of recording. And then I would stop after he'd leave. I'd stop and I'd go, you know what? I've got to take instruction and he's got a gifting. So I would lay down that track and I would go, so good. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, and so some of the songs that if you hear some of the songs, a lot of them, it's because he's walked in and said, I like this or I'm hearing this. And so it's really a neat deal to know that uh, he's coming in and collaborating and yeah. putting little guitar riffs and things. Even though he doesn't know how to do them, he can hear it. Yeah, he's got the yeah. ear for it. So yeah, he's got the ear for it. And he's How's done the drums on one of he's the songs. He's done the drums on the song, yes. Yeah. Y'all going to start a family band? <laughs> well, it's kind of that way. We're trying to get Asher, Asher to do that. <laughs> I was going to ask, does he, has he shown any interest in drums or anything like that? He's yet? shown interest in almost every instrument you can think of. Yes. Even really weird ones. <laughs> that we go from overseas. Indian flutes, cool. things like yeah. that. But he hasn't found his niche yet. It's like okay. he bounces just... <laughs> 
We have some friends. When we went to Korea, oh, yes, we had I've friends that. that lived in Korea. <clears throat> and so they flew us out there to be with them. He was in the military. They would send us stuff all the time from overseas because they're just big travelers. Born and they would send us instruments, like weird, <laughs> very weird instruments. And I'm like, what on earth? Well, there, Bugles. there's one in particular that Asher has just taken a liking to, and it's almost like a bagpipe. Yeah, it kind sounds of like thing. a bagpipe and somebody strangling a goose. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's probably the wrong. closest that you'll ever, That's you know. That's hilarious. So, so he goes and he gets that on Tuesday, I think it was. He's like in our bed, <laughs> writhing in pain and moaning and groaning and all the stuff. And he, Asher goes out on the back porch and he's just strangling the goose on the back porch, which is right there by our window. And I have to go out there and I'm like, Asher, why don't you move to the front porch? So he goes to the front porch with this weird instrument. And for like 20 minutes, he's just out there playing. I don't know. There's no telling what he's going to play. There's no telling what he's going to play. He's very gifted in like archery. Yeah. Very good archer. He's very good martial artist. Uh, The hands-on that type of a thing. Yeah. So he's that type of kid. He loves that type of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, making fires, that type of a thing. So Survivalist. He's with drums, though. He really has yeah. been kind of jumping on the drums lately, and he's he got has. great rhythm, but he's just that kid that he's kind of, he he's not focused on one thing. Yeah. No. He's all over the place just kind of playing around, which and we let him do because yeah. we want to make sure we, he knows what he wants. He exactly. wants to do his own thing, too. Oh, absolutely. He wants to be by himself. Yeah. You know, you might try, hey, come over here. I'm going to show you this rhythm. Yeah. And he'll look at it and then walk away. <laughs> he doesn't want to take the instruction. Mm-hmm. Or he doesn't want to show that he's taking the instruction. And then later on, he'll go in there he'll and sit him. down. And he, well, yeah. how old is he? 12. He's 12. Almost so that yeah. sounds about right. Yeah, yeah that checks out. Yeah. 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 Okay, so our logo here at Heritage is making winners in life. What does that statement mean to you all? To me... As a martial artist, if I use that as an analogy, you know, there's a, there's a rule or a saying that we have on the, as far as taking your black belt test, because your black belt test is very grueling and it's very long and you might know the techniques, but to be able to do them for four hours and then to fight, you know, multiple opponents and everything, we have one rule and that rule is you don't quit. And so to make winners in life, to me, you know, coming here with a Christian walk is being able to endure. Amen. You're not, you might know the moves, so to speak, you know, but um, learning to walk them out in that process, no matter what comes your way, not stopping, you know, finishing the race, um, hanging around people of faith that strengthen you and keep you going in that race. And you can encourage one another, lift each other up. That's what making winners in life is to me. You're a winner when you don't quit. You're continually moving forward. Amen. It's that grit. It is. And that faith in God that keeps you going for years and years and years. And just not saying no, not throwing in the towel like Brother Jerry loves to say, not throwing in the towel and keep moving forward in faith. Yes. Amen. We loved having you guys today. That's it for today. What a joy it was to hear the story. We hope it blessed you as as a listener and that you take the time next Friday to join us again. Of course, if you want to know more about the Barthens, we will have their social media handles and how you can get in contact with them linked in the show notes. Thanks for joining us on Winning Conversations. We'll see you next week.